In the nearly six years since Amanda Knox was accused of killing her roommate in Italy, her story's captivated the world for many reasons, because she's a bright-eyed, all-American girl, it seems, because she was convicted of a horrid crime in a foreign land, and because at times her pleas for innocence seemed to many people more cold and calculating than remorseful. Tonight, ABC's Diane Sawyer speaks with Knox in an exclusive interview just weeks after the Italian Supreme Court overturned her acquittal. So every word she says here, and in the pages of her new book, Waiting to be Heard, could affect her freedom. An American girl home in Seattle, back with her sisters, now grown up. <laughs> nice. Okay. Neither of us fell. And sometimes she says she's just that daughter who never left and wanted to be near her parents. She was always, you know, home and, yeah. Eating your food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My mom, I can tell anything to. Anything. Sometimes when she doesn't even want to hear it. <laughs> there is much to hear. A five and a half year old journey that began in a Seattle suburb and ended with Amanda Knox becoming a global obsession. In headlines called a sexual thrill seeker, a seductress, the murderer of her British roommate, Meredith Kircher. She devil with an angel face, heartless manipulator, concertante of sex, sphinx of Perugia. I haven't heard those. I mean, I've heard the gist of them. And uh, they're wrong. For all intents and purposes, I was a murderer, whether I was or not. She had stayed near home for college, made Dean's List, but when she was a junior, decided it was time to venture out. An adventure of fill in the blank. An adventure of selfhood. She worked three separate jobs to earn the money for her year abroad. Her mom was excited. Wanting me to go for it, to be brave, to go out and be my own person. I really got that from my mom. Her sister Deanna dropping her off in Italy and making a video as they head there, teasing her about her new life with the boys she'll meet. First, that naked Michelangelo statue of David. Are you excited to see David? Uh, David. David, the statue of David. Oh. <laughs> well, dude, I swear to God, I don't know what it is about people who think that guys are not attractive physically, but... You look at the picture of the girl who arrived there. What would you want to say? I want to tell her not to be afraid of what's going to happen because what happened to me hit hit me like a tr a train and there was nothing i could do to stop it she has only been in italy five weeks going to school in the morning working at a bar at night one night with meredith she goes to a classical music concert and sees a young man who reminds her of harry potter a graduate student in computer science raffaele selecito says he can't believe the beautiful uninhibited american is looking at him. Colpe de fulmine. Un colpe di fulmine. That's a, a lightning strike. Yeah. Um, he he writes about how taken he was with me, and I really liked him as well. They become a couple for just one week, seven days, before they enter the 24 hours that are at the center of this mystery and this debate, starting with the night of November 1st. When Meredith Kircher is murdered. What are you doing the night of November 1st? November 1st, we stayed in and we had dinner. We watched a movie. A witness confirmed she and Raffaele were in his apartment as late as 8.40 p.m. His computer confirms that someone had ordered the movie, Amelie. We smoked, we had sex, we were together. We just hung out together. We made faces at each other. We were being silly and together. How high were you? I had smoked a joint with Raphael, and what that did to my memories was it made them less concrete, but it didn't black them out and it didn't change them. You remember with clarity that you did not go out that night. You stayed in the whole night. We stayed in the whole night. The next morning, it is undisputed that Knox is the first person in the house after the murder. 
She says she made the five-minute walk from Raffaele's apartment to take a shower at home and get fresh clothes. You go home to take a shower? He has a shower. Why go home? Well, he had a crummy shower. She says she noticed the front door standing open, thought it was odd, but the latch didn't always work. She took a shower after seeing blood in the bathroom sink. She says wondering if maybe Meredith hadn't cleaned it up, or was it her own newly pierced ears? At the sink when I was taking out my earrings that I noticed that there were speckles of blood. But speckles, a few drops. Did you see the bath mat? Did you not see Not yet, footprint? not yet. I saw that when I was getting out of the shower and I thought it was strange. But you know people look at this and they say, door open, blood in the bathroom, those are red alarms. Well, I had never before experienced anything in my life that was drastic. I didn't think, oh my God, someone's been in here and murdered someone. Amanda Knox says she went back to Raffaele's and then they returned to the house together. They saw evidence of a break-in and Raffaele calls police. Her roommate, Philomena, is there when the door to Meredith's bedroom is knocked in. Amanda Knox says she's on the phone with her mother when she hears a torrent of Italian she doesn't understand. And someone was screaming a foot. And I said, I don't know, I don't understand. Then Philomena was crying out Meredith, and so I heard that it must be Meredith, and that there was a body, and that there was an armoire, and there was blood, and there was a blanket. From this point on, Amanda Knox and her behavior will be a kind of kaleidoscope, shifting shapes depending on what you see, what you think is inappropriate behavior and evidence of guilt, or as she says, just a kind of tone-deaf girl in a trauma. Police will say her strange behavior is guilt and heartlessness. Did you kill Meredith Kircher? No. Were you there that night? No. Do you know anything you have not told police that you have not said in this book? Do you know anything? No. I don't. I wasn't there. At the police station, she sits in Raffaele's lap, playfully making faces, telling Meredith's friends that Meredith must have suffered. You're quoted as saying, how could she not? She got her effing throat slit. Yeah. I was angry. I was pacing, thinking about what Meredith was, must have been through. Sorry about that now. I wish I could have been more mature about it. Yeah. You can see that this does not look like grief, does not read as grief. I think everyone's reaction to something horrible is different. The first image much of the world will see on newscasts, video taken outside the house the day of the murder. I've seen the same picture, like the kissing just can't stop, and that's not what that was. When you look at the tape, there are three quick kisses. Then, the rest of the time, she stares into space. She says, thinking about random fate. I felt very lost, very alone, and very vulnerable. Vulnerable. My friend had been murdered, and it could just have easily been me. Somehow, she had died in the house where we were living. and it could have been me. She would be arrested, convicted, sentenced to 26 years. When we come back, she talks about the long nights in prison and the encounter with a prison official. It was always after lights were out and no one was out and about in the prison and he would call me into an empty office and talk to me. Just talk? 